Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Hard Lens Media. This is Kit Cabello. I'm joined here with my two fellow co-hosts, Paul DuPont and Daniel Lupker. Uh, Lauren Hun will not be in the studio today. She'll be joining us sometime a little bit later uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, but other than that, we have a great uh, show for you guys. We have a lot of breaking news stories, as well as our special guest, Jeffrey Cubbage of the Illinois Green Party, will be joining us in the later hour. So first and foremost, I'm going to start this story off with the tragedy that happened in Florida. Um, now, as we are all aware, a bridge, a crossing bridge used by pedestrians, um, collapsed, which injured, uh, well, basically killed six people and, and injured a few others. Um, it was built by a, uh, the, it was built by a freelance group called. Um, the FIGG Bridge Group designed the Florida Pedestrian Bridge, and that's the bridge that collapsed. And apparently, uh, they built it within a day or two days or, or so. And so, with that kind of uh, oversight, I'm surprised that uh, the thing even held for the amount of days that it was still built up. Because yeah. how are you going to build something, right? And then assume that it's going to be okay. We we talked about infrastructure and failing infrastructure in the past. And this is just lack of oversight, lack of regulation. And just to let all of you know that this same firm uh, will be building the new Klein Avenue Bridge, uh, which will stretch for more than a mile, rising 10 stories above the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal, uh, and it'll open next year. Now, it's a $140 million project that will replace the old Klein Avenue Bridge, which was closed and condemned in 2009. So right off the bat, I'm just... uh, I'm so afraid to even cross that bridge knowing that the same firm that built that pedestrian bridge in Florida is also the same uh, firm that's building this bridge in Indiana. I think two things. I think first we shouldn't critique a company for building a bridge quickly. Yeah. China puts down a new railroad station in 19 hours. They just know how to do it right. And in this case, you have a company who has, I believe, 11 different safety violations. It's accrued from its practices over years and knowing the way that we organize uh, and regulate and allow companies to do what they want, it doesn't surprise me that this company was just one of the companies that um, built a bridge that wasn't uh, able to be built the way it was. It was done cheaply and quickly in a way that didn't work. It's different if it's done in a way that does work. Right. And then further... um, I'm curious to see because it's one thing to build a – to just go, oh, we have a small drop. If you're a company that's building a giant bridge that's over a mile long. And 10 stories uh, above the uh, – But regardless, it's – you put a different amount of effort into making sure it works than a footbridge over a street. So this is – this was probably – this seems more likely to me that it's a case of – Negligence? Yeah, it's a, it's a small pro- it's a small project. Just have someone do it. We'll pro- they probably subcontract. Wasn't it that out. a six lane road though? Yeah, yeah. Like, so but, that's a that's kind of big. That's a but, big project. Yeah, that, that, that is a serious project. But it's also, a, it's a project. Also, he, here's uh, something for everyone to take into account. In 2003, the firm was sued by Delaware over what state officials called uh, faulty engineering of the Indiana River Inlet Bridge that was never completed. And after it was discovered, the embankments were unstable. Uh, FIGG paid out $5 million to settle the lawsuit. And in 2012, a nine-ton section of the FIGG bridge under construction in Virginia crashed onto railroad tracks below. The Commonwealth sued, saying it was pure luck no one was killed during that accident, which delayed opening of the bridge for more than three months. Um, you know, I, I, I would not trust these guys to build well, anything. I mean, my greater point is that most of the bridges in the U.S., are similar oh. to this in some way. Well, well, they're, well, they're all falling apart. Our well, entire that's, that's my point. It's, it's, it's mostly due to age, though. Yeah. Right? Well, but my, my point from it is, is to only be afraid of these bridges by these companies, if that's the degree of fear that would innate that would enable that fear to exist. Yeah. Is kind of useless if it's not spread across. No, I'm pretty sure. Other, I'm pretty sure yeah. other companies are doing the exact same and thing, it, cutting corners. I'm not saying either it's cutting oversight. corners yeah. right now or it's. A bridge that was meant to last longer, but no one's paying anything to maintain it. It works yeah. out the same way that most of the infrastructure in the U.S. is not so dissimilar from this bridge that fell. Yeah. In this case, it just was really shoddily constructed, whereas those bridges were well constructed but poorly maintained. 
poorly maintained, lack of oversight, lack of regulation on the state and federal level. And this is, this is what we talk about, like regulations. Regulations aren't necessarily a bad thing. They're protections to protect people from uh, private corporations that uh, may decide to cut corners and put a lot of people's lives at risk. This, I mean if we just look at these bridges, for example, there have been numerous times where like other large corporations – have uh, you know used the lack of oversight to get away with what they wanted to do? Take for example in East Chicago, Indiana, where you have these large industrial factories and uh, you know um, refineries dumping toxins and poisonous uh, material into our air and water. Well, I think the, if my point, my kind of the greater point I'm trying to make is the U.S. doesn't care about infrastructure. Oh, of course, the U.S. Yeah. doesn't put money into infrastructure. We used to put, I think, what was it five percent of our GDP? into infrastructure building and maintenance and now i believe we put less than a half a percent of our gdp into it Mm -hmm. so if you are a city or a town you're going to have that same mindset of we don't have money to spare we don't have money to allocate for these construction projects let's get the lowest bidder and so this bridge that was put in florida was most likely either a no bid contract or it was a bid contract and they went with the lowest bidder because the u.s doesn't care about infrastructure. We don't care about potholes. We don't care yeah. that we have perfectly good bridges that we just don't maintain because we don't have the money to do it. Yeah. So because remember, the, the person buying the bridge, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's like the university directly or something, even, even if it was, they're not going, hey, I want to get a bridge that will stand the test of time. They say, I want a pedestrian bridge that people can walk over. Someone make it. There, our priorities are different. Imagine if we had the same... Uh, viewpoint when we were building the Hoover Dam, when we were building any of the the, the highway system, yeah. they, they would have never gotten built. Or when they, if they did, they would just crumble the second they were put together. The second the Hoover Dam would have had pressure applied, it would have, would have fallen apart. But at that point in time, people cared about doing it correctly and doing it right the first time, and not we'll do it the cheapest possible way we can. If we have to cut corners to save a buck or two, we'll do it. Yeah. That's the mentality that's both given – that companies have, like you were saying, but it's also the attitude of the people that hire them that just want the cheapest bridge possible, like it's a T-shirt or something. And same thing to, towards the elected officials that turn, a, that turn a blind eye to it because perhaps maybe they're paid off due to the fact that we have money in politics. And this, is, uh, this goes back to the points that we always mention, like find out where your elected officials stand on current issues – Find out where they stand on public safety as well as on regulation because this exi- this one uh, crisis that happened in Florida, there's going to be more of it. And it's just not just one example. It's just there's, there's plenty of more. And it's up to all of us really to step up and make sure that we have a stable infrastructure that doesn't fall apart on us. Cause and, we, yeah, I think ahead. to be clear, I, we're not criticizing the ability to build something quickly. Yeah. We're not criticizing the ability to build something cheaply. We're criticizing building something without adequate safeguards to um, the integrity of the works project, right? If you if the the idea with this bridge is they kind of built it on the side of the road and then they kind of hoisted it into place and put it on its foundations. When you do that quickly, if you don't have adequate checks, if you don't have adequate testing. Something like this is going to happen. I, and I wonder, did it collapse? I don't know if you know this or not. Did it collapse after they had completed and were like, all right, it's all done? Or were they still working on it? They were still – they posted it up and they were still working on it, but they had cleared traffic. They had closed they traffic. Had, they had cleared traffic but to they go did, again. But okay. they didn't want to close it for so long because it's a very busy road and a lot of commerce goes down that road. So they had to very quickly turn it around and open that road back up. And, and it so when that, it seems. So when that bridge was being – cars were still going underneath that bridge, people were still actively working on it. Mm. And from what I can tell from um, the collapse, it like collapsed in the center. So it looks right. like it wasn't strong enough – to even hold itself up, which if you had any engineer could tell you that, I'm sure. That seems like for a bridge that small, you could probably just get one engineer to look it over a day. I'm I'm not an engineer. I don't know exactly what the process would be. But that seems like something that would be very quickly picked up. I mean, that that kind of a bridge problem seems like homework that would be done by, like, sophomore engineering students. Right, yeah. Can can these materials hold this in this configuration properly? Oops, no. Maybe we shouldn't have built it and put it over six lanes of highway first to find that out. Research, research, and sometimes cutting corners is 
going to cost you. But so, that's that's what I was, yeah. that's what I was saying but, uh, with my original point that it's that it was designed in a way that cut corners. Um, it was designed in a way that it, I'd like to know who oversaw and check marked that bridge for safety. Yeah, hold, hold because, them accountable. Because again, a, my point: a bridge that small shouldn't take more than one engineer that much time to just go. No, this won't work. It's a bridge that goes over six lanes of traffic that was built on. I mean, this seems this was cutting corners again. It was just doing it too quickly. They wanted to get the road back open too quickly. Yeah. They probably the, the the bidding process didn't adequately. You know, this was just a failure, but it's a normal failure. It's a failure of the configuration that uh, we've come to know for the last forty years. Do it cheap. Do it fast. Cut corners. It's yeah. almost like the desire to make money and save costs. Ended up costing lives. Hmm. Mm. Well, time to find out who uh, was responsible, who gave the green light to let it uh, go through, and uh, who were the officials that uh, turned a blind eye to this as well. So, you know, we're going to follow through with this story and see what happens. But now, from one crisis to another, uh, Daniel, this is uh, your expertise because you are a former lead contractor, and we've done some coverage in East Chicago, Indiana. You've been, done some coverage in uh, Flint, Michigan. So take it away because I think this is something we all have to deal with, and it's our good friend, Led. Yeah. Oh, and just for the record, I'm currently still uh, – oh, yeah. Oh, my, my bad. Okay. So this case was – this one, this is why the story really struck out to me. This is a case um, – story that we got – I found on CNN about how the amount of people that are affected by lead poisoning is 10 times higher than they originally anticipated. Now, I think of lead in kind of several stages. First, lead is a – very, very toxic element to the body. What it does is when you ingest lead, especially at a young age, it's less dangerous as you get older, but it's still dangerous, that um, lead, when you take it in your body, your body, because of the, because of how atoms function, uh, your body confuses lead with calcium. And so the one of the biggest places that uh, lead will go is where calcium goes, and where is that? That's in bones. And which will which will leach back into the body, and it's in the uh, neurons of your body, which require sodium and calcium at their at the gates for the um, uh, the ner- for the uh, uh, the neurons to work correctly and fire correctly. So primarily your brain. Your yeah, your brain, but the bones have effect because it makes bones weaker as well. But mostly, yeah, it's the brain. The brain has um, what was the word I'm looking for? The brain has. As you know, you're growing your your brain, especially when you're a younger child. When your brain's growing and you have lead in your system, um, it starts replacing all this ca- all these calcium channels in your brain. And what that does is it's the equivalent of like looking out in Chicago right now and just randomly just putting a giant thirty foot boulder in an um, intersection, just a random intersection. And that's the what lead does. It just causes the entire chain that causes information to move in your brain through your neurons to just stop at that neuron wherever it is that has um, that lead in it. So it just dead ends your nervous system. And if you just kind of think about that, it's like if it, there's one intersection in the city that's like a giant boulder, everyone can go, well, don't go where the giant boulder is. It's no real issue. Just go around it. Here's an alternate route. But if every other intersection or 10% of the intersections, it's very hard for anything to happen effectively and the same thing happens in people's minds so what happens it lowers iq it causes aggressiveness in people it has a huge amount of other health con- uh, um health issues that will lower increase your risk of mortality um and just general decreasing how you can live a life and how well you can live it and i always go back to mentally in the when we had leaded gasoline from the from the 60s until um, we uh, we banned lead uh, gasoline, everyone that was around back then had a lower IQ because they're constantly breathing in lead. And again, what are the traits? It's more aggressive, more uh, again. It's it's uh, more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, we think if people just act, they react quicker yeah, than they should. They're ha- agitated. They're agitated. You know. But yeah. the point uh, the point with that is. Is that at that point everyone's breathing in leaded gas all the time? So yeah. everyone had lead poisoning in America only a few years ago. Right. And now, what this study, going back to the study, what the study is saying is that it's they estimated for a while how much lead was in 
the environment. And now they're saying about 212,000 deaths occur every year due to lead poisoning of one form or another. Daniel, I want to ask you a question, and you've, you've said it before, but I think it's very clear that the audience needs to understand it, and perhaps again one more time. Uh, what is the safe amount of lead that technically humans maybe are allowed to be exposed to, and, and what's the type of lead that's right now in East Chicago and what they're, what they're being exposed to? So it's the same. I could, I could rephrase the same question. Yeah. How much anthrax is a safe amount to have yeah, in your body? Exactly. How much? I mean, I mean, but it's a toxin. It's, it, 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 it's clear it's a toxin, but I mean. And it's, and it's a heavy metal toxin, yeah. which is very, very dangerous. You don't want to have any lead in your system. Sadly, there is lead in the environment, and it's uh, places it is naturally occurring in the environment, mm-hmm. and there are places where it's man-made concentrations of lead in the environment. I mean, going back to even paint, one thing people don't realize with children mm-hmm. is lead is sweet like chocolate. It tastes great. I mean, going back to the Roman era, they had very bitter wine, and they sweetened their wine with lead with lead briquettes, and they, and they drank out of lead cups. Yeah, and that's the acidity is leaching all that in. Uh, actually, the reason people in the medieval era thought tomatoes were poisonous for so long is because they would cut their tomatoes on pewter plates, the wealthy would, and that would leach the lead from the pewter. Mm-hmm. Lead has been with humans as a valuable metal and a toxic metal since we've been doing things. I mean, the, yeah. the plumbing system here in the U.S., many countries – Roman era, yeah. all done with lead, and it and, always and, has these very terrible effects. And I just want everyone to know, too, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Roman history, particularly the Julio-Claudian dynasty. I know it's a little bit off subject, but uh, with Caligula, you know, the mad emperor, everyone always says that he was crazy. During his first year, he was okay. It was only when he had this huge, massive uh, you know, he, ha- again, brain hemorrhage or go, something, like, 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 like he went to a coma, yeah. and then he just did a complete 180. You have to realize, with him... Very young person. He yeah. was like 18-ish, give or take. Uh, 18, maybe mid-20s. I mean, he became I, emperor at a very young Yeah, I think age. he became emperor at eight, 18. But one thing yeah. he was known to love was Roman wine. Yeah. He would drink 8, 10 bottles of it a day. And so if you have a still-developing brain, because, you know, a brain of a male develops all the way up to about 25. Again, lead gets less dangerous over your age. It's still always dangerous, but the effect yeah. it has... And the nervous system, since the nervous system develops fully, there's less chance for going in. It will just go more or less to your bones or pass through you. Yeah. It'll still go. But So if you have a kid that's that age who's drinking that much lead, mm-hmm. what do you expect to happen? I mean, yeah, it, 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 it going to happen You have a guy later. that no one can say no to that likes to drink all the time, and he likes to drink what is poisonous. Yeah. it's This is what lead does. This is how lead is. So now going back to this um, – There are people in the U.S. that are still completely poisoned by lead, whether it's from the water that they're drinking, but it's more likely – water is a big issue. We've covered water for a while, but the vast majority of the incidents are from infrastructure that still has lead in it, mainly paint. So if you are are poor and you have to live in uh, substandard housing and that housing – is an old building that no one wants that's falling apart that's dilapidated. And if it's built before uh, 1978, before it was illegal to uh, use lead paint, it's going to have paint in there. And one thing paint does that has lead in it, it's very good at turning into dust, Yeah, uh, much more than acrylic paint is. And so then you're just breathing in lead dust. And although paint isn't like 100% lead, it's a few percent lead, you're breathing in dust of heavy metals, and especially if you have a child uh, that's growing up in those conditions, yeah. they're going to be breathing in lead. They're going to be interacting with lead. The area around uh, the, the these buildings are going to also have lead from that same paint right. because it'll just go into the ground. So if you're playing, you get dirt on your feet. This is what we had when we went to East Chicago. You then get lead in your system because it's just everywhere in the environment. And, and that's and the areas that are super, super impacted and we now know that just in water there's over yeah. 3,000 towns and cities that have high lead levels somewhere in their water because that goes back to what we said in the previous story no one's investing properly in adequate infrastructure oh exactly because if yeah. people decided hey let's if the people are so big on creating jobs how many jobs are you going to create if you have to redo the piping in every major city because it's ancient and needs to be replaced mm-hmm. well you know another thing we have to take into account let's look at chicago and our public schools, and some of our Chicago public schools have, you know, it's been recently found that there's lead in the school's water. 
So here in Chicago, a major metropolitan city, uh, you know, supposed to be a rich and powerful city, um, apparently our students are being exposed to lead as well in their water because of a lack of proper investment into the infrastructure into our city. And this is mostly affecting uh, low-income uh, minority communities. And even beyond that, it's – I mean it mainly does, but it's to the point that we don't care enough that it's even richer communities. There are a few – wealthier neighborhoods all over the country oh yeah well it's, 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 it's going to get to them too what well, i'm, I'm sooner saying or later it's, well, it's already there just in lower numbers but then again there are lower numbers of very wealthy communities yeah so this my point is this goes back to again go back to that bridge store we just covered it's it the country not valuing infrastructure even though infrastructure is one of the most important things to building a successful country the u.s became the envy of the world after uh, World War II when we did these massive infrastructure programs and even before during the uh, the New Deal era. Mm-hmm. And we put huge amounts of effort. At the time that we did the highway construction with Eisenhower, that was the largest earth-moving project in the history of the planet. Now China's beaten us with, with several projects that have done more than that. And it's – this is something that isn't being focused on in this current era because it's not profitable to do. It only benefits citizens, and it only benefits people that aren't contributing. There aren't huge – there aren't enormous plumbers unions that are stronger than some other corporate entity that can pay more money for something else. So if you are fighting if, – if you're a government budget and you're being fought over by a 100 different groups, the ones that – the way we've configured the country, the way that the country has been configured, I should say, those – the people that win are the people that have the connection to politicians, and that's not plumber unions lobbying to get pipes fixed. So on, on the study, I have a couple of questions for Daniel. Um, so it, it concludes that about 412,000 deaths every year can be attributed to some kind of lead uh, poisoning. And it's a 20-year study of 14,000 adults uh, from across the United States. Um, and one of the things I thought was interesting is um, – that we know that there is a link between high blood pressure and uh, lead contamination. But one of the things they found was uh, that there's also a correlation between uh, lead poisoning and cardiovascular mortality. So heart attacks. Right. Uh, was that something you were aware of? Did you, had you, I, that was that, I found that surprising. Well, I, I mean, I, I've, I've been studied it in a doctoral sense to really understand what every part of the body. I know that it's the nervous system is heavily impacted. I don't know if that cardiovascular disease is due to because you know the the there's like a, like a its own unique nervous system yeah. that's in your heart. I don't know if that's the part if it makes the heart less efficient or if it's that because it's leaching into the body, it's attaching to things and it just makes those things weaker in the same way it would in the brain in a different way. It doesn't surprise me if someone you know if someone said you know lead also had increases cardiovascular disease, my response would be, oh, that's interesting. That makes sense. Can you tell me more about it? Mm-hmm. So if, they, if they're saying that there, that doesn't surprise me at all. I just don't know specifically um, how exactly how that plays out. I found that interesting, though. Um, and I wanted to point out one other thing in the study is that they, they talked about people in sort of the 90th percentile of lead contamination and their mortality rate compared to people in the 10th percentile and below. And for their study, what they found was that the 10th percentile and below had a lead concentration of one microgram per deciliter of blood. And in the 90th percentile, that figure was 6.7 micrograms of lead per deciliter of blood. And that goes to show you just how toxic it is that the difference between 1 and uh, 6.8 is so great. But you have to remember if you – how would that okay, so how would it factor in? So you have obviously what you like you have if it increases cardiovascular disease, well obviously that decreases life expectancy. If you're someone that has it to start with by just aggregate numbers, you're probably already poorer. And if you have it affecting your mind and you are and you can't sit you can't sit in school, you can't think as easily because those paths are blocked, well, then you're going to have a harder time graduating school, which, of course, makes it harder to live. And if you do, it's you're still going to have a comparative disadvantage with the way the brain is functioning due to the poisoning long term. I mean, there's so many different ways that all these traits in lead play out in society that makes whoever has it worse off than someone who doesn't. It may, Again, it increases aggressiveness. So 
if it's a minority community, well, that well, there you go. That's an increase in people that will get killed or shoot people because if you if you're getting killed because you, if you're not listening to police in a way that uh, free, whatever it may be, you get my point with that. And then if yeah. you are easier to draw to anger because of that impulsiveness that is caused by the lack of channels in your brain, so you're more likely to turn a situation that could not de-escalate into something that escalates into someone dying. I mean, you can think of all these different scenarios, how having your brain affected in that way, having your body affected in that way, having grown up where it's concentrated would cause so many people to die. And I think beyond just the deaths that are reported in the study, we have to think about that's just in a sense, deaths are always the tip of an iceberg. That's the worst outcome. How many people have lesser outcomes where they don't die, but they live with it. Again, going back, it's um, even though it's still widespread, it's nowhere near as widespread as it was in the U.S. when we had leaded gas in the air. Mm -hmm. So even though all this is happening and it's still terrible, and again, we still have all this infrastructure that's falling apart, it's still preferable to when we just were breathing it in consistently and it was covering every surface. So it's better, but it's still worse. It's... We're not putting in money where it needs to be put in. And it's, it's, a, it's another example of lack of oversight and lack of caring at the state and federal level. And it's up to us now, again, to step up and get people in office, in power, that can protect us and make sure that uh, this amount of exposure of lead goes down. I mean, it's, it's going to be difficult to get rid of these, this amount of contamination from our environment. But if we don't put effort into it now, the long-term effects are going to be devastating. Here's the thing that I really wish – government would care about. And I feel like if you took money out of politics, it would. What is the economic loss of that many people dying every year in the U.S.? How much investment has been put in through schooling? How much through taxes, through infrastructure that they use? How much lost productivity is there that they will never do in their entire life? If they're, if, if again, just as a prison example, if someone's working and they're able to work every year, they're putting money into the economy and the GDP Gross. So if you have, again, I go to Walmart just because their margins are ridiculous. If you pay someone twenty grand a year at Walmart, they're making the company about $80,000. So that goes away first. And then if, you, if they're dead, they're not producing anything. They're going to affect any family they have around them, make that. It's just a cascading effect. So what is the economic cost of doing nothing? That's what's not factored in. They don't factor in what's the cost of half a million people dying every year. What that does to the country, what it takes away from the country, what it takes away from the economy. I know a lot of people care about the economic arguments. So they say – they look – what they do is they look at the cost of replacing pipes and fixing this and they go, wow, that's a lot of money. I don't want to spend because it might look bad and hurt my chances to get reelected and people might not be happy that I'm increasing their taxes. But what they don't factor in is – and again, this is due to the way that politics works now and the it's more important to be uh, reelected for most politicians than it is to actually serve your uh, your uh, your area that they just say, I'm not going to be the guy that does it. I don't want to risk it. And they don't factor in and then maybe they can't because it's the benefit that they would draw would be after they leave. I mean, unless they're going to stay for several terms over over decades. They're not going to see the benefit of what they do, but everyone's so short-term. Everyone's thinking so quarterly about issues like this. Of course they can't see a long-term solution. It's the same reason that NASA can't fly anywhere because every new administration wants them to do something different than their predecessor. So they gear up to go to the moon, and then they're like, oh, no, we're going to gear up to go to Mars. Oh, no, wait, now we're going to gear up to launch a satellite. No, 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 now we're going to go back to the, the moon. It's – it's 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 expected. This is a expected, reasonable result of a country that's configured like ours. It's short-term thinking with money put in places that has short-term benefits while ignoring long-term benefits and long-term costs of short-term actions. It's neoliberalism at its finest. It it's is. a neoliberal establishment that uh, both Democrats and Republicans in power uh, use. It's a system that they like. It's a system that their donors, who are uh, Wall Street investors, large companies, um, you know, the top one percent, and the banks, and this is the system that they built. And it's up to us again to get actively involved and vote them out. Because if we don't, this is going to keep on happening. So let's move on to a story 
that uh, a little bit more of, of, of a sign of perhaps things to come. And this is uh, happening in Philadelphia. I got a l- little bit of my heart in Philadelphia. That's where we, me and Daniel uh, you know, first really did some investigative journalism and really uh, – you know, put our feet to the fire uh, in regards to just, you know, getting stories out there. So It was very hot back then. Yeah, it was. It was like, what, 98, 100 degrees over there? You were saved by that bottle of water? Yes, I was. Socialist water, too. Yeah. Thank you. So so thank you, whoever you are, that, that, that wonderful person passing out water. You, you saved my life. Um, but this is happening in Philadelphia. Philadelphia's uh, newly uh, minted district attorney, Larry Krasner, he was uh, meeting with constituents in a packed church in West Philadelphia earlier this month to discuss his plans for the job. And this meeting, uh, there was a, it was pretty unique because he was talking to all the local civic leaders and everyone there, including like high-ranking community members, about uh, you know what kind of policies and platforms will he uh, you know implement should he be elected. And he's making good on his promise to revolutionize the job of district attorney. And in the process, he's offering uh you know an experiment in justice reform at the municipal level and perhaps maybe this could be done as a study for uh a case to to, to use on a national level so basically he, here's what he was doing he sent a memo to his staff according to the article basically indicating that he is going to uh you know push forward with his policies that he set on the campaign trail and an effort to end mass incarceration and bring balance back to sentencing so uh, here's here's what's happening. The most significant and groundbreaking reform is how he has instructed assistant district attorneys to wield their most powerful tool, and that's plea offers. Over 90% of the criminal cases nationwide here are decided in plea bargains, and the system, which is now broken beyond repair, uh, passes out like minimum sentences, standard, standardized prosecutorial excess, and it's just causing a lot of people to get arrested, right? So uh, Or be incarcerated. So now what's happening is uh, Krasner's 300 lawyers are starting now to do plea offers at the low end of sentencing guidelines, and for the most nonviolent, non-sexual, or economic crimes below the 50,000 threshold, Krasner's lawyers are now uh, are now to offer defendants sentences below the bottom end of the state's guidelines. So, take for example, if a person with no prior convictions is accused of breaking into a store at night and emptying the cash register, he would normally face up to 14 months in jail. Under Krasner's uh, program, he'll be offered probation if prosecutors want to use their uh, discretion to deviate from these guidelines. Say, if a person has a particular troubling rap sheet, Krasner must personally sign off on it. So that's that's pretty interesting right there. And that goes to the same forward thinking I was just talking about with the lead story that we just did. That you have this guy – okay, so – what is the cost to the economy, to a community, to a family of someone going to prison? It's very high, not to mention the cost of actually housing them. But there's in also prison. more. But there's also more because this is very interesting too. He's also, uh, you know, Krasner's lawyers are now also now uh, basically going to decline charges for marijuana po- uh, cannabis uh, possession, no matter the weight, effectively decriminalizing. Uh, possession of cannabis and cannabis related materials uh, for, uh, for for the city of, of for all non federal cases and then as for sex workers, they will not be charged with prostitution unless they have more than two priors in which case they 'll be diverted to a special court and that's that 's something pretty interesting there too i mean l- l- let 's face it um, cannabis is being accepted nationwide it 's people are in favor of it democrats republicans independents you know Look, look at the state of Colorado. They have a budgetary surplus. Look at the state of California, Washington, and Oregon. Their their economy is growing. The fact that uh, we have, a, you know, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the third, you know, wanting to reignite the war on drugs, mm-hmm. specifically on cannabis, uh, it, it goes to show you the backward thinking of this ridiculous war on drugs. And like I was just saying, it's. Think of what is the cost. Okay, so you have this giant prison industrial complex, which effectively makes the U.S. a slave country yeah. by the way that they operate in the um, loopholes well, 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 in the Well, it's free labor. Look at the prison industrial complex. Well, that's mean. what I'm saying. Think of how much does it cost the U.S. to put so many of its people away for so long. We've estimated that it's about $5 an hour per person to be in prison, and it varies from prison to prison. But $5 an hour for that many people, 
I mean, aren't Republicans really tired of the welfare state? I mean, this is enormous. It's growing faster than the school budgets do. And what is the result of it? You have the normal result that you see with normal prosecutors is, well, we're just following these guidelines and we'll put you away for 40 years. How much money is that going to cost? How much money does that take away from taxpayers? Again, you take someone away from a family that they have. If they, if they have a family in a community and you rip them out and you, then that has ripple effects there. You have, again, productivity that you didn't retrain them into being able to do. It doesn't solve the issue of someone not having a sustainable way to live and a, and a mentality that lets them do that. It just hardens people. So if you put someone that smokes uh, uh, cannabis in prison for half a year, well, who are they hanging out with for half a year? Who do they have to survive for half a year? Are they a different person when they come out? How does that affect their life? And so what this guy is doing ostensibly is he's – tweaking and improving the long-term outcome of his state Mm -hmm. past when he's in office because it's clear for someone to do that that they're not trying to sell out the small surpluses they get every day. They're letting them grow, in a sense creating an old growth forest rather than growing uh, 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 trees for 10 years just to cut them down. And the uh, environment that comes with it, that culture that comes with it is able to come back. It brings back – this is going to help – them in 20 years from now what he's doing by how he's affecting their lives and i give him full props and and you know it's also creating a much more compassionate um you know court system you know the system that we have right now is you know you're you're guilty especially if you have especially if you have possession of cannabis uh on you And, and if you're a person of color well then you're really out of luck because the prison industrial complex mostly targets minority communities working class communities and you know, most of the jail population here in the United States are African American, Latino, or uh, other, and it's it's just starting to get really disgusting that here this great bastion of democracy, of uh, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps that you could be- make yourself into anything. It, it you have a, you have a prison system, a law system, and a court system that just jails you right on sight. And remember, if you are jailed, you lose about 3,000 rights as an American citizen. Yeah. No one's going to hire you yeah. because that's what everyone's been trained to do. But if you're a large corporation or a bank, especially in 2008, and you crash the economy, you're too big to fail, too big to jail, and you get a little slap on the wrist and a golden parachute. Yeah. So so, so it's okay. Since we're talking a little bit about prisons and incarceration and as it relates to cannabis, another story I saw this week um, – was a a big push uh, from cannabis rights rights groups to do what we were talking about a few weeks ago, what they're doing in San Francisco, right? Expunging the past records of people who had been incarcerated for cannabis usage now that the state has recreationally legalized it. So these cannabis advocacy groups are reaching out to states that have recreationally legalized cannabis and basically demanding expunge people's records. You know, that's... These, this is, these are things that are preventing people from being able to get jobs. They're removing people from productivity in, in the community. If, if this is something that's no longer illegal, let's, let's clean up people's records who were imprisoned for it just maybe six months ago. Also, I just want to let you know that um, Larry Krasner was also working alongside the mayor of Philadelphia in regards to dropping 51 cannabis charges in mass. Uh, he also joined the mayor in pushing uh, for Philadelphia to become the first uh, American city to have a safe injection site, a clinic where people can inject drug- drugs under nurse supervision and receive uh, additional treatment uh, if if they choose to. He's also suing 10 pharmaceutical companies for alleging their marking me- methods have fueled the uh, opioid crisis. And the thing is, right now, the United States is suffering from a devastating opioid cri- crisis. It's affecting all types of communities, large cities, suburbs, small towns, uh, and it's affecting everyone in the social class. So, I mean, th- you know, kudos to him. I wish we had somebody like that here in Illinois someday. And I think on top of that, it's just stuff that's so obvious. I mean... You know, European countries. There are some European countries that have some red light districts where they have sites like this. You know, mm-hmm. clinics and treatment centers. I think the best example is Portugal. Portugal, yeah. when they um, they basically have decl- uh, decriminalized all drugs. Because one thing that people don't really get is 
that if it's criminalized and you have an addiction, you talk to you are talked to by the police. If it's decriminalized and you have an addiction, you're talked to by medical staff, right. which is enormous in its impact. And so with these safe, I'm a huge proponent of these type of ejection sites because you look what happened with um, well, Portugal. Since they started doing those, they've never had someone overdose in and die in those clinics because when they want they'll as they put it they'll give you as much heroin as you want as long as it's not enough to overdose with when you eject you eject with medical staff surrounding you and they have plenty of stuff to try and get people into rehab programs so they get out of it so now you have a system that used to be these guys that are addicted normally due to the drug pushing of legal drug manufacturers who pay lots of money to keep that legal uh, drug uh, being produced. And now, again, we have like carotene being thought to be um, uh, made illegal, even though it's helping people get over drug addiction. And now, in like Portugal, it's, I'm addicted. I can go whenever I need to to get these drugs, and they're going to be clean. I'm going to have a clean needle, mm-hmm. and they're not going to stop me. And they're, as they put it, there there aren't new heroin users in Portugal. There are just people that are either stuck or the people that are able to move on. Also, it's another thing to uh, important to point out is that also holding corrupt police officials accountable for their actions. Uh, some time ago, uh, we did a story about where 14 individuals were wrongfully uh, put into jail. Uh, they had uh, false evidence put on them, false charges put on them by four police officers. And you know that's just one small story here in the city of Chicago. I mean, it's it's happening nationwide, and here in Philadelphia, you have one district attorney saying, "No, we're going to hold these corrupt police officials accountable. We're going to hold their chain of command accountable, and get real accountability, real civilian oversight over the police department." Look, we we want our police to protect us. We want our police to do their jobs, and at the same time, too, we want to get out all those officials, those those police officers that are corrupt. And it will do more damage to the community. We want them out and also hold their leaders accountable for just turning a blind eye to their actions. And I think it's also you – know? it's the same we're, – we're critical of police on this show and yeah. I think right, completely rightly so. We're not anti-police. We're not against the concept of police. We're not yeah. against individuals who are police officers. What we are against is a system that police officers exist in which incentivizes rash action, increased killing, uh, corruption, and all these negative things that people have been crying out about. And what we're asking for is a creation of a system where police are safer, citizens are safer, and the communication between police and citizen citizens is overall positive and yeah. trustworthy so that people can have the confidence – to call the police because their neighbor next door is getting violent with his girlfriend and not worry that when the police get there, they'll accidentally shoot them because they're freaking out that someone exists in front of them and they have to kill them yeah. because it's causing a 5% threat to their ability to exist. Like I said, the way that the police are currently trained, let alone the fact that they're only trained for six to eight months. Yeah. Um, to have the abilities of a lawyer, have the abilities of uh, someone has to shoot, someone has to de-escalate, a therapist. Yeah. You can't do that in six months. I'm in favor of more European style yeah. uh, police training. Uh, but beyond that point, police that don't, put, don't need to put themselves in such risk yeah. if they're trained better, if the ones that are harassing the community – don't spread that because of you know codes of silence. If people can trust the police, going back to that original example, people can trust the police that they can call police and they will take care of a situation without killing someone. That redefines how the interaction within the community occurs. And what we've been asking for is let's do that. Let's, let's have accountability. Let's, let's have, have accountability. Let's, let's have if justice. If someone's – what they said, it's a few bad apples where they don't ever finish that sentence, which spoil the bunch. Yeah. If you take away the bad apples and they you punish them for what they do, other police will react to that. Because right now you can shoot someone and say, I was scared, and they're like, yeah, that seems legit. Well, at least in Philadelphia, you have one district attorney that's trying to bring in reforms. And if he's successful, which I hope he is – 
this can be used as, as an example to be done on a national level. Um, but that being said, I definitely want to follow more through with the story and what he's going to do in Philly. I hope someday to see Philadelphia again soon. Uh, but I'm going to push the story now to Paul DuPont, and this is in regards to our backyard, the city of Chicago, and Chicago leads in the United States for the most underwater homes. Yeah, so the, this is a story from Cranes. Um, this was a study that shows that as, what, we, what we mean by underwater homes is not homes that have flooded. That is, that is not what we mean. What we mean is homes that have lost value, and so the money owned – the money that is owed by the mortgage holder is greater than the value of the home itself. So that number in Chicago is 135,000. There are 135,000 homes in Chicago that are worth less than the amount of money that the person owes on the mortgage, which is a terrible situation for the for those individuals because they're it, they're put in a situation where they can't sell their home because if they were to sell their home, not only would they be selling it to someone, but they would also have to come to the table with money themselves. They would have to pay money to sell their home. So what that does is, in effect, keeps a lot of homes off the market, which tightens the, the housing market. And it keeps it, it sort of causes a, a, a cycle that keeps uh, home prices low. Uh, it's, it's really, really... Um, a tricky situation now percentage wise as far as large cities go miami has the largest percentage of homeowners that are underwater some parts of the year they're probably also underwater yeah perhaps <laughs> literally um boy yeah they're having a hard time climate change um but yeah the the numbers in like for example the numbers in los angeles uh, is, is 60 uh 87 000. Uh, and that's a much larger uh, population base than Chicago. So percentage-wise, um, L.A. is much lower. New York is much lower. Um, Chicago has been sluggish in uh, the rising value of homes since the 2008 uh, financial crisis compared to the national average. And this would also tie into what we've been covering with uh, Barrios, that it's the amount of money that's paid for homes – is much higher than it needs to be due to much wealth. Again, going Sears Tower, now Willis Tower, but always Sears Tower, is worth a billion dollars to the banks, yet it's paying $500 million. Uh, uh, property taxes as, as if it's worth $500 million. So what happens to that? I think that comes out to about $5 million a year. What happens to that $5 million a year? Well, someone else pays that. And so if you're in Chicago, your taxes are going to go up. And the tax – I mean taxes – and then, of course, the TIFs will then pull that tax money back out so it doesn't even get to go back into your schools. So, of course, your home values are going to be lower. From the outside, it's – you have property taxes that are far higher compared to the value of the house than it – for to make a value acquisition – of the house to make it sell for a lot of money at the same time, all the benefits that one would expect of high property taxes, good schools, things of that nature are siphoned away. So it goes to areas that are less well off that don't have proper funding because their money's being siphoned off, um, dealing with higher property taxes because they're the, the money gets pulled off to the city. Emmanuel uses it as a slush fund to help people that are paying him, money through donations, and then you have the connection of the Barrios uh, uh, tax cuts that he gives through his assessor office to so those same people that are connected to the city and Mike Madigan. So those people, mm. in a sense, funnel that money to them. Oh, you want to build a luxury condo? Here's $20 million that used to would, would have otherwise gone to a school in this area, but yeah. we're going to give it to you. And then once they, if they build that condo, they can go, well, I want to lower the taxes on this condo, so then they reapply those uh, taxes back to those areas. So of course they're underwater. The system's developed in a way to siphon money from their environment to make the area less valuable and higher and raise the taxes to make it less the homeless valuable. I thought we didn't like wealth redistribution. Oh, I guess we only like wealth redistribution when it goes remember, to the top. Remember, yeah, to America, the top America is fundamentally a socialist country. It's just socialist from the top down to trickle down socialism where if you're wealthy and you have the money to do what you want, you will get subsidized with no questions asked. But if you even dare ask for a better hot lunch, how dare you talk to me? 
Yeah. And and that's just how it is. And look at what's happening to the people in Pilsen, Inglewood, South Austin, uh, especially uh, even on the northwest side of Chicago as well. I, I mean, so many people are being displaced because of the increase in rent and home ownership. The, uh, you know, we, when we had, uh, you know, the uh, Our Revolution Illinois endorsed candidate Fritz Craigie here, who's running for Cook County Assessor, he's went in detail what happens it, when you shut down a school, it is the death blow to a community. And when that school is, school is gone, basically all of the um, you know, uh, bordering homes and businesses suffer. They, they lose their value. And then when you have these large real estate developers move in and buy property, force people out, raise the rent, raise the value of the properties, people get displaced. And it's, it's happening here in our Chicago, Chicago, which is a hyper-segregated city. And so ostensibly you know, what happens is you've gone through bad. all this. Your home's already underwater where you're li- and you don't have that much money you're making. And all of a sudden, because of the gentrification efforts, you're, that, the, the amount you have to pay in your taxes is even higher because the land is now worth more money. Even if it's not in your area, it is in your town. And you pull away the school. There's no real roots. So if people have to move if they have children or they have to have them you know, trek for eight eight miles a day which remember people don't want to do in mayor Emanuel during his uh first term in office shut down 50 schools and during that time uh, all the young children especially in the low-income minority communities had to walk extra miles just to go to the new schools that they were assigned to and that's is that the kind of city we want to you know live in i mean because i don't i don't want to live in this kind of city where it's you know, you're displacing people who have been in these communities for generations. That's the heart and soul uh, of Chicago. It's our, it's our long ancestral roots here in the city and what the people have contributed to this city. But here we have uh, a city government, a mayor, and even the Cook County uh, you know, commissioners basically turning a blind eye and not caring about the people at all. And so that goes back to the – And it our, goes back to money and politics too. It goes too. back to money and politics, but it goes back to what Paul was saying earlier. This is – you have a situation now where homes are underwater and people are now stuck. Yeah. But from the city's point of view, well, they don't matter. They just move them out anyway. It's 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 a, it's a great flippage. It used but to be. Boy, do they work hard when they want to get reelected again? Say, I will fight for yeah. you, Mayor but, Emanuel's new image, where he's you know trying to be uh, uh, a leader in the resistance and saying Chicago's going to be a sanctuary city. But man, boy, do you really know how to treat the people who've been living in the city for generations, long before you came into power? Well, I mean, there you have it. I mean, you can look at it even if you want to look at it really cynically and tinfoil hat like. You can look yeah. at like the Qua- Laquan McDonald shooting, and you can say from his point of view that he could say, "Wow, this is really going to make a lot of the African American community not want to vote for me." How do I solve that? Oh, we just keep gentrifying, get them because it's, it used to be many years ago. Um, minority groups are moving into pr- predominantly white areas, and white people fleed to the suburbs. Right. And now it's a reverse of that. That. Uh, People, uh, minorities are being kicked out, and white people are like, oh, new jobs in this area. Because the jo- Chicago seems to be positioning itself to be a, a second tech hub similar to Silicon Valley. And so that's what I see them building right now is they're building a lot of uh, uh, areas for people that have the money, that have degrees, that have good jobs. Tech field has a lot of good jobs. It's why they're trying to get Amazon in. It's why they're trying to do a lot of these different. Um, and I really hope we don't that get doing. Amazon. I really hope we don't get. But Amazon. Th- but that's my point that they're bringing in. They're changing the demographic of the city, making it smaller and whiter. Yeah, and we've seen that. And well, we've seen it com- firsthand. It's a very again. It's like everything we've talked about today. It's all issues that affect other issues that are affected by other issues that are in a sense circular. Right. Because. They're feedbacking on themselves, and they, all they can do is per, per, um, perpetuate what already happens because of the sheer momentum of the money and the will that is being pushed onto these communities. Right, and I think uh, we're going to have to end it on that note. Uh, we're going to be entering into our first break. So uh, for those of us who are listening to us on Q4Radio.org or if you're listening to us at 1680 AM, thank you so much to our live stream audience. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are going to go on our break. On our second hour, we're going to have just a little bit more stories as well as our special guest, uh, Jeffrey Cubbage of the Illinois Green Party, will be joining us in the second hour. Uh, if you like what we do, we have a Patreon page. Your support and help builds us uh, 
better content, better we have a chance to get better resources to to produce more for you guys. Um, all of you who have uh, supported us through Patreon, it's because of you guys that we have this show. It's because of you that we're able to do a majority of everything that you see when we're on the field. So thank you, everyone. And you can find that on hardlensmedia.com. Hardlensmedia.com. Peace, everyone. See you in the second hour. And we are back. Welcome to the second hour of Hard Lens Media. Thank you for tuning in. You can listen to Hard Lens Media every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time on Q4 Radio. You can listen to us right now at www.qu4.org, uh, or you can listen to us at 16:80 a.m. Or you can just check us out on our Facebook uh, page, Hard Lens Media. We are live on our Facebook page, streaming. Uh, and if you want to learn more about us, uh, there's www.hardlensmedia.com. H R D L E N S M-E-D-I-A dot com. So, again, welcome to the second hour. we got a lot of stories to go over. And first and foremost, the Illinois State primary. Look, we have to focus on this uh, because it's it's reaching down to the wire, especially in regards to the governor's race. It's uh, a tight race between right now uh, Chris Kennedy, uh, Illinois State Senator Daniel Biss, and J.B. Pritzker. Gentlemen, I want to open this floor and get your thoughts on at least – uh, the candidates, uh, what they're fighting for, and uh, the reality of which of these three can actually get the nomination to become the Democratic candidate. Daniel? So, um, so I think we got a very interesting race. It's, I think the governor's race was much closer than I ever expected. Yeah. I think it's any – Kennedy, Pritzker, Biss, any of them could win. I think there is still a advantage going into Pritzker, but – I haven't kind of kind of uh, been able to truly evaluate the latest revelations with his offshore accounts that have just mm-hmm. come out. How much that's going to affect people? Because I know before I mentioned a while back that if he had one more big reveal, that that could affect him. And I'm just not sure exactly yeah. what effect it's had. So if on the twentieth, I, I or the twenty first, if I woke up and let's say I slept through all of election day, and someone said. Pritzker won, or they said Kennedy won, or they said Biss won, I would be equally um, unsurprised. Right. So, All right, Paul? Yeah, um, I was going to say the exact same thing about Pritzker. I'm not sure how much that's going to affect his his race. I thought it was interesting. I just noticed the uh, Chicago Tribune uh, is endorsing uh, Chris Kennedy um, uh, for the Democratic gubernatorial race. I don't know. I, I really want to see uh bis do well i'd like personally i'd like to see bis win it um but i haven't seen any recent numbers that show him moving drastically uh in the polls but it is very close the interesting thing for me is the lack of polls i mean usually with primaries you we see a ton of polls which says something to me because who does the polls normally wealthy large wealthy corporations mainly news corporations that are owned by uh, larger that, corporations, yeah, that, which are owned by, yeah, yeah. it's the... Which, fr- which in turn own mm-hmm. the news. So it's important to note that this kind of reminds me a little bit of the 2016 primaries in regards that um, when it came to, you know, polling data between uh, Illinois, uh, not Illinois, uh, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, very rarely would the polling data match. I mean, I remember one time where uh, it stated that Hillary Clinton was going to win Michigan and Wisconsin, but instead it went to Bernie Sanders, and everyone was like, "Well, I, we didn't expect that to happen. We didn't expect, uh, you know, Sanders to win. And all, all the data, you know, wasn't adding up." And so, and so, I'm seeing a similar case here in Illinois. And I just want everyone also to know that some data, some of the polling data, data that I have seen, uh, it stated that 31 percent of the state is still undecided between Pritzker. Kennedy and Biss. Well, there's another thing that I wanted to mention with the um, previous um, polls that came out. Yeah. So I always have an issue. I always look at the methodology of the polls. Methodology of a poll is more important than the poll itself hmm. because it tells you because it tells you how people are being picked, who is sensibly getting picked, and for a lot of these polls, it's long-term, highly likely Democrats contacted by landline, and Biss is targeting millennials, people that are younger, people that aren't traditional voters, people that weren't old enough in many cases to be long-term demogra- uh, Democratic voters, people who don't vote regularly, and people, again, who are younger, which is all the all, – that entire group of people that BIS has uh, targeted 
are exempted from those polls. So when I see those polls, it all it tells me is, to an extent, how strong how strong Pritzker is against Kennedy, because their demographics are. It's very again going back to Kit said it's very similar to, to Hillary and Bernie in that Bernie got people that were younger, she got people that were older. The same is true of Kennedy. Kennedy seems to get the more left leaning, older like boomer type population um, that likes progressive ideas and things to do. And uh, Pritzker, and this is in a very large sense stereotyping the overall results because it's not every single person. Right. And Pritzker is getting the more standard, uh, regular voting, long-term voting, Democratic people. And so what I'm curious about, and I've seen when Our Revolution did their poll, we had their poll conducted, I forget who they had it conducted by, and they included the youth and factoring in unlikely voters, he was very close to first place. It's the poll that brought him into second place. And then they did that poll like a week ago, which... Again, went back to not talking, only doing landlines, doing people that were older. So, of course, he did a lot worse than that. So I think that it's going to come down to, I think the numbers of people that are going to come out for Pritzker are pretty solid, pretty predictable, similar with Kennedy. If BIS can actually, on election day, turn out a large amount of youth, and remember, we have first, we have same day registration, so you can bring a friend who isn't registered to vote, and I'm sure people are going to do that. If that turnout happens, and it happens in a large enough way with large enough numbers, I wouldn't be surprised if he won. It would it'd be a similar kind of effect that what happened in Michigan with Sanders. Right. I don't know if it's going to happen, Right. but if it does, I would give him the advantage. You know, I with, with Pritzker and all the stuff that's coming right now about his offshore accounts and any other scandal is going to probably come out pretty soon. Um, I, I don't think he has this in the bag all the way. I think if anyone is is to take it, it would probably be Chris Kennedy, um, just because he's kind of stayed out of the whole having a scandal. I mean, he's had he said some dumb things on the campaign trail, especially in regards to you know some sort of compliment he gave to Bruce Rauner, but I think it was taken out of context. Mm-hmm. Um, but. With with J.B. Pritzker, I, the thing is a lot of people, especially downstate Illinois, they hear that name and it's, oh, it's a Cook County Democrat. Same thing for Kennedy too. It's a, it's, it's another Cook County Democrat. But I think – And same that, for same for Biss? Of course, same for Biss. But it just – it seems that the outreach though for, for Pritzker and his campaign, it's not as strong for, for most of Illinois. It's, it, it seems that there's a little well, bit of a pushback. Most of the Democratic candidates are really pushing for Cook County. Yeah. And – well, well, Cook but, County's the deciding. But down county. south, I think Pritzker still has an advantage. Last I remember checking he, he, his polls, he does. But it, I don't know. Mostly, the, I know mostly the because of commercials be. and the radio. But what yeah. the turnout turnout's going to be key, right, that's especially on who's on who's going to get the nomination. But you remember, know, Biss still normally, has a chance. Normally, no one votes in primaries. Like I've said to yeah. everyone, you want to count for the most citizens at any given time. Vote in a primary because you'll probably count for ten citizens. Yeah, it's when your voice is most heard and. Simply put, primaries are far more important than the general election because you're right. getting to pick the person to fight in the general election. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is the time where you get to pick the person that you like the most. The strongest candidate. And we, and we learned our lesson in 2016 and, when, we, when the Democratic establishment rigged the primary and gave us a corporate candidate and lost miserably to Donald Trump. Right, and from this one for, for where Biss is at, like I said, it really comes down to all of them have a shot. All of them have a clear shot to win. Yeah, Bruce Runner isn't that popular. I mean, he lost support from the Republicans in the House and Senate when it came down to the budgetary crisis that was happening. Um, and many people are holding him accountable for it, the way our state is being run right now. It's it's we're we're suffering from uh, lack of resources, lack of uh, investment, and lack of clear accountability. And you know, J.B. Pritzker. Chris Kennedy and Daniel Biss have a chance to win, but I think in, in regards to the race, I mean, Kennedy and Biss, they'll have a much better chance of having a stronger lead over Bruce Rauner if one of them were to, were to face off against him. Yeah. yeah, and so it's it it's it's important to note that you know you have to turn out to vote. If you don't turn out to vote, especially during uh, this primary, you're, you you probably won't like how the general election's going to go, especially during the midterm. Paul, well, I was just going to say, what, do you have any? thing that you want to talk about with regard to the House candidates? 
Oh, the um, you mean talking about for like was Marie Newman getting Bernie Sanders endorsement or or even Anthony Clark? Or... Well, well, yeah, sure. Let's bring up Anthony Clark. I mean, he's yeah. he's gaining a lot of ground and especially calling out uh, the current incumbent uh, who is in the seventh Illinois congressional district. So um, that's you know Danny Davis. You know, so I think with Clark, it's going to be interesting because. I know he's been struggling for a while to really get a strong ground game together. It seems like presently he has one. Yeah. I am currently leaning like in a 70-30 that it's too little, too late. Mm. But I think that if he was to do this and then run again in four years, I think he would have the – he would probably win if he was to even repeat the same thing he's doing now. I mean a lot of these very, very long – entrenched candidates that are out there you can't beat them in one shot you gotta run again against them not that i don't think that he has anthony has a a chance of winning Uh, i think he does but i think that he doesn't have the same he has it's a much it's different we were just talking about with this pritzker kennedy how that's a real toss-up i think that there's a clear advantage that goes to danny davis Mm. yeah but you know then also there is the aftermath of 2016 to where people are tired of the Democratic establishment. And, you know, we have groups like Brand New Congress, Our Revolution, and Justice Democrats, each in their own right, uh, stepping up to try and reform and have progressive candidates take out these, you know, established Democrats that, for the most part, vote in favor of the banks, vote in favor of Wall Street, and, uh, you know, are bought by the top 1%. Yeah, but I would say with... uh well, first you have the district itself that yeah. he's in. From what I understand, he's actually done a very good job of getting Oak Park to uh, like, like him. I'm not exactly sure. I don't have any numbers for that. But just driving around there, he's his lawn signs are very prevalent. So seems like he's doing well there. Uh, I don't know the rest of the district he's running in, but I mean the reason I, I have the I've made the uh, I've looked at the way that I am is that for the most part. Anthony ran um, almost by himself for most of the campaign, and one person can only do so much without a team. Mm. Whereas Danny Davis already has the name recognition, already has the team, he has the money, he has all these all these things that you could ask for as an incumbent. And I just don't see a, a campaign that, for the most part of its run, had one person really doing the work, having the ability to convince so many people away from Davis. I, I'd like to be wrong. Um, I think that'd be far, that'd be a far better outcome in my opinion, but I just, it's what I think is uh, how it's going to play out. Hmm. Well, we'll see how that race turns out. And let's not forget that there's also, um, you know, a few other congressional races that are happening all across here in Illinois, especially let's not also forget the Illinois attorney general race as well. I mean, that race has got about like that race. Nine, I have no idea. Who's nine candidates. Win. I have, you know, I have no idea who's going to win it either, but it's probably going to be to the candidate that's been out there the most, probably has the most campaign ads playing, most signs out there and probably the most recognizable name. Uh, you know, so <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, that's a crazy race uh, yeah. because everyone, like if you have, Two or three percent, you still have a chance of winning. Yeah, because it's so many people. You have nine people. That's like what is that? About eleven percent each. If you just get a, if someone gets, I'm sure like the AG candidate is going to be someone that gets fifteen to twenty percent of the vote. Yeah, and mm-hmm. which is ridiculous. But it's um, that I have no idea how that race is going to turn out. We have no idea how the governor's race is going to turn out. Um, I think for some of the state seats, you have like Marie Newman. She was. She, she, it's actually she, a congressional seat. She's a congressional seat. She's a congressional seat. Yeah. yeah. But, um, the third Illinois congressional district. I think the one that we do know who's going to win is Chuy Garcia is going to win that seat. I mean, he got the endorsement of Bernie Sanders. He got our revolution. He has everyone backing him. So I yeah. think that's the one where we can say yeah, we'll Chuy be, Garcia has it. I would be more surprised if um, he lost that race than almost any other race that we've covered. Mm-hmm. I think it's very clear that. But Chewy's going to take it all the way. But in the race between you know Congressman Dan Lipinski and um, Marie Newman, it's actually getting pretty tight because he has like forty three percent, she has forty one percent so far. And in remember the, data. those polls. Remember all these polls if they're conducted by the, they do landlines, yeah. which just completely skews the voter turnout of who's yeah. going to actually make a choice because of the vast difference of progressives that are younger than. 
the huge percentage of younger progressives that exist that don't get counted because they don't have the landlines. Yeah, and let's not forget Dan Lipinski has a long record of voting in favor with his friends in the Republican Party than ever uh, standing true with his uh, progressives or you know ever standing true with any progressive values or voting in favor with the Democratic Party because uh, he has a track record of being uh, anti you know anti-abortion and uh, he's voted uh, on a lot of harsher policies as well so and yeah then I think for the seventh we it seems like wolf has been no that's for the fifth it's for the fifth, fifth yeah yeah right yes um, seems like wolf's been knocked out we haven't seen any activity from uh, his he, campaign his social media account has been uh, in you know, silent in, mode in silent mode blackout and he said his yeah. campaign office is just Re- re- recently, one of the Twitter accounts that has uh, been following Ben Wolf's campaign for a while actually did a photo in front of his campaign office. Lights off. Nobody's there. Uh, we are still kind of – some contacts are still reaching out uh, to us about Ben Wolf. We want to do a, a better – you know, fur- once we get more information, then we want to give you guys a much more further story about it because it, this, the man is a you know, systematic liar. So right off the – you know, so just, just – it's – it's going to require more data and more research, but he is he's lied about everything. So, so, so we so have, yeah. but we have remaining in that race. We yeah. have uh, we we have remaining in that race is um, Samina Mustafa, Samina Mustafa, Steve Schwartzberg, and then Mike Quigley, uh, who is the current incumbent. So those are the three real power players left to get the Democratic nomination. Now with Wolf, I mean, I don't know how many people are still going to vote for Wolf. I don't. I think that he's been. I think his campaign is done. Yeah. And but, so the, it's, but, it's, but it's, not, it's no, the point it I want to no make. Part. The point I want to make with it though is, he is people that were going to vote for him. They're probably going to go to I would estimate uh, both the other candidates. But I think uh, Samir, uh, Samina. She has the support of the justice. She Democrats. has the strongest yeah. ability to pull them. So from her point of view, from her campaign. I'm sure this is very nice because it increases her chances. And plus, she made a statement about Ben Wolf's activities as well, which is on point. I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying that she probably will get the lion's share of yeah. um, of um, what, what's what's left, what they have to do, and um, so we're going to see how it we're going to see how it turns out. I, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see who gets votes. Yeah, for the fifth Illinois congressional district, I think definitely we're going to because we're actually in the fifth Illinois congressional district, so. Uh, it's really Speaking to you live yeah. from the 5th Congressional District here mm-hmm. at Q4. Yes, exactly. Well, we'll know what the outcomes of all of these races are next week. Yeah, March 20th will be the day. So, you know, I really wish before, as I know we got to top off this, uh, we have about a minute left for this segment. We need to bring back, we, we need to actually enable gambling on political races. Because I've seen, <laughs> I've seen what that does in Europe, and they care about politics because it will help them get better odds. Oh, so, that really? is an interesting point of view. Well, then let's do it. Come on. Let's push forward. Let's go, everyone. Let's make gambling legal here in Illinois. No, let's just gamble on election races. Because it's like a – Do you know it's how not, many people can do it all the time? It. You just, it's every two years. <laughs> it's, like, it's like people that get into fantasy football know a lot about football because they're in fantasy football leagues. Exactly. So – Gamify uh, it. <laughs> so that being said, guys, uh, we're, we've been talking about the Illinois primary, but we're going to talk about another aspect of – election season here in illinois we are joined here by a special guest jeffrey cubbage uh he's been interviewed uh by harlan's media before uh and it's good to see you again but this is the first time here you're on our show so since this is the first time uh being on our show uh could you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers about uh the reasons why you are building and supporting the green party here in illinois Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. My name is Jeffrey Cubbage. I am the secretary of the Illinois Green Party currently, and I'm also one of our candidates for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, one of five candidates in that race. Uh, I came on board with the Green Party in Illinois in 2016, summer of 2016, uh, and I came on board as someone who had prior to that been doing most of his work for a consulting company out in Afghanistan, a group, a project, group that did uh, development projects, agricultural projects, things like that. And I've been an oversight reporter and a top-level report writer and all of that as a contractor with them. And that was a real education in what a country looks like after America has bombed, bombed it into the ground and then turned around and sort of turned on the money spigot, turned on our foreign aid policy and the mess that that creates. And that had me searching around right. for some way to get involved at the home front that was opposed to that kind of policy. And I realized very quickly, well, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans oppose 
uh, our, our military or our foreign aid as we're doing it right now. So that drove me to the Greens pretty quickly. Mm. So uh, let's actually talk about third parties for a second because it's clear that our current system is dominated by both Democratic and Republican uh, you know, leaders who control the system at the state and federal level. And it's very difficult for third parties to have a spot on the debate stage, uh, you know, you know, get uh, ballot, uh, cover, you know, get ballot access, or get coverage from any media at all. And so, in Illinois, in particular, the Illinois Green Party and the Illinois Libertarian Party, they need to get twenty five twenty five thousand signatures plus an additional twenty five thousand signatures just to have a secure spot on the ballot and to be on a potential debate stage. So, why is there so much resistance towards having third parties on on the ballot and debating the other two candidates? Sure. It comes from a lot of different directions. Part of it obviously comes from the people who are in power, right? Every state right. writes its own election laws, which means that it is the Illinois legislature that writes and modifies our election code. Anyone who's in that legislature got there playing by the existing rules, got there in the existing system, so they have zero motivation to change it. It worked for them, and it clearly didn't work for their opponents, so why would they change it? So there's that, that inertia right there. Then on the media side, it is a lot easier to report on races when they're a, a two-party horse race, when it's just there's Team A and Team B, and everyone thinks one team is good and one team's evil. It makes the story a lot simpler. You can turn it into a soundbite. It's very convenient. Uh, the media doesn't really like parties that make you break out of that binary, get out of the left versus right, red versus blue, you know, Marx versus Smith, however you want to break it down. As soon as you get more than two binary polls, it gets much more complicated to report on, and editors don't necessarily like that. All right. Um, Paul? I wanted to ask uh, a little bit about, you had a Facebook post just a few days ago um, about voting for, uh, voting in your district, but you said you didn't vote for yourself. I wonder if you could regale that story for us. Yeah, so this is a tale of uh, election law in Cook County and how weird that can get. And anyone who's ever tried to file for office in Cook County knows uh, how Byzantine the process can be. But so the, the, real long, uh, the real short version of it is this. The City of Chicago Board of Election Commissioners is a separate election authority from the Cook County Clerk's Office. Now, the race I'm running in, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, is a Cook County race. It is administrated by the Cook County Clerk's Office. Candidates who file for that office file with the Cook County Clerk's Office. A vacancy was created for a fifth seat on that district right at the end of the filing period. A man named Timothy Bradford died, one of the seated commissioners. That created a vacancy of Bradford is what they're calling it, but it was too late for candidates to file using the regular process. So what the Cook County Clerk's Office did, rather than allow Bruce Rauner to appoint a, a replacement, was they said, we'll put this on the ballots in November. This will be a November general election seat. But to get on the ballot in November, you have to run as a write-in candidate on your party's primary ballot in March. So that's what I'm doing. I am the Green Party's registered write-in candidate for the vacancy of Bradford election. Now, uh, Illinois state law says... When a candidate files as a write-in candidate with the election authority to whom petitions for that office are submitted, a primary shall be held. So that's what we did. We submitted a write-in uh, statement of candidacy with the Cook County Clerk's Office. And they said, great, we'll print ballots. Your name will be on it. The City of Chicago Board of Election Commissioners has claimed that because we did not file as a write-in candidate with them as well, even though they are entirely within the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, they are not obligated to print ballots. Now, I don't think that legal theory will hold up, but it's, we, we, it's three days till election at this point. The odds that it's going to be decided in court before then are pretty much non-existent. So yeah, it, it may set a useful precedent for if this one weird situation ever happens again. But in terms of practical effect, it means we have to get all of our votes from the suburbs. And write-in elections do have a minimum number of votes. You have to get as many write-in votes as you would have submitted petition signatures. So to get onto the November ballot, I need 1,720 suburban Cook County voters pull the Green Party ballot, and write my name in. It's a huge hurdle. Oh, wow. That's, that's a huge... Uh, well, I do have to decline. say, we've interviewed a few people that have done right, and your name is more easy to spell than them. So yeah. you have at least that going for you. Uh, Jeffrey with a G for all our listeners out there. All right. Uh, so uh, I think it's very important for a lot of our viewers to understand different seats that are, that are being, you know, uh, you know, that are up for election. Uh, recently, we interviewed candidates that are running for the SEC, uh, State Central Committee uh, for the Democratic mm -hmm. Party. And for a long time, a lot of people just didn't know what the SEC was. So in this case, for your election, uh, you and four other members of the Illinois Green Party are running for the Water Reclamation Board of Greater Chicago. So for our viewers, what is, is the significance of these seats, and what role does it play in our daily affairs? Yeah, so the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, MWRD for short, mm -hmm is a taxpayer-funded agency that is responsible for three things in Cook County. They are responsible for flood abatement and flood management. 
They are responsible for sewer and wastewater treatment, and they are responsible for testing the water quality of our waterways, of the actual water in the streams and rivers. Um, and it is managed by a nine-member board of commissioners, and we elect those commissioners. We elect them in partisan elections. Uh, for the past several decades, uh, every commissioner elected to that board has been a Democrat, so it's been one-party rule uh, for the better part of my lifetime. Um, and often that's been because, you know, there was no one else on the ballot. These have often been uh, uncontested races in the past. But uh, this year there are five seats that are going to be on the November ballot, and we have five Green Party candidates for it. Uh, the Republican Party, I think, filed like two candidates, and they don't have one for the vacancy of Bradford, so they will not have a full slate. But the Green Party is, is the only opposition party out there that has a full slate for this. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about some of the problems we've seen on the board, some of the issues that we think uh, need to be addressed there. Um, go for it. Please do. You you go for it, yeah. Yeah, dive right in. So let me just, I'll try to keep it brief here, but what we've seen well, on the go board. Go in detail, please. What we've seen on the board uh, during these years of, of one-party rule is uh, an increasing slowness to change and an increasing amount of what looks to be insider dealing, pay-to-play sort of politics. Um, we, the MWRD is a huge taxpayer expense. Their budget is over a billion dollars a year, billion with a B. Um, and that is a tax tax line on your uh, on your property tax bill. There's a sewage uh, sewer sewer bill, MWRD bill, um, and where a lot of that money goes is to private contractors. They hire private firms to do everything from infrastructure projects to document shredding to like managing the parking lots. You know, there's all kinds of private contracting flowing out of that. And we did an analysis. We sat down and took a look at where that spending had been going. Five years of it is available online. So we looked at all the contracts issued in the past five years and found that about 60 percent of the contracting budget went to campaign donors of the MWRD candidates who currently sit on that board. So private firms would donate money to the re-election of these Democratic uh, board members. They would then bid for contractors, contracts with the board, and those members would be voting on whether or not to approve the contract. And unsurprisingly, they approved all of them. They never rejected the contract bid that came up in front of them. So that's something, you know, the idea that there's no oversight, there's no other party that's willing to push back on that right now and hasn't been for 20 years uh, is, is worrying to us. Uh, you know, the Green Party is not an austerity party. We're not like, let's starve government to death, but we want the spending to be responsible. We want it to be going to things that, that help the citizens of, of Illinois and of Cook County and of all of Illinois because what happens in our waterways here goes downstream, right? Yeah. So this is a Cook County election, but it affects the entire state when you're yeah, talking and, about water And quality. we need fresh, clean water to function yeah, and, and, you know, to live. Yeah, and that, that mission, the clean water, is another, is we have huge concerns about that. Um, you know, the Tribune did an examination last year and found that on average we are dumping raw sewage into our waterways, untreated sewage, every six days in Cook County. There is a raw sewage outflow somewhere. And that's because the infrastructure we have just isn't capable of handling rain when it hits Cook County. I want to ask a quick follow-up question to that yeah. because that's one of my questions right here. What kind of political action can the Water uh, Reclamation Board of Greater Chicago do to bring justice and to call for new infrastructure to be built? Yeah, so some things they would need buy-in from other government agencies, right. right? As soon as they get off their own land, they're going to need City of Chicago buy-in, Cook County buy-in, State buy-in. You know, there are all sorts of different levels of government in play here. But one of the things the MWRD can do unilaterally is use the land that it already owns. The MWRD is a huge landowner. They have nearly 10,000 acres of property in Cook County. They're supposed to use that for flood prevention or water treatment purposes, but they play landlord. They rent it out to private industry, including waterway polluters. The EPA has actually sued tenants on MWRD land because they polluted the waterway with chemicals that aren't supposed to be there. There's oil tanks, there's a, an antifreeze manufacturer, all rented out on taxpayer land owned by the agency responsible for water purification. But what they could do with that land instead what the Green Party would like to see them do is devote it to rain-absorbing green infrastructure, right? We have a system of tunnels and reservoirs, but we know it doesn't work enough. The Cook County is almost completely paved, so as soon as rain hits the pavement, the only place it has to go right now is into the tunnels, into the reservoirs. Those back up very quickly, and it's a combined sewer system, so when the rainwater comes back out, it's bringing all the sewage with it. So what the Green Party would like to see us doing on those 10,000 acres of land is creating wetlands restoration, planting deep-rooted trees, doing things that will absorb the water before it goes into our gray infrastructure that we know isn't adequate. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to just jump back to the, at the beginning we are talking about. Can you explain to people that don't already know what you're running in as Green, we've had Libertarians, they've been saying the same thing. What are all the, the large disadvantages that you have to do? Because it's not just that... You're running for a Greeno. People don't know about Greens that much. There isn't money. What is the extent of how much harder it is for you as a Green to get on and uh, win a primary challenge of any type versus a Democrat or Republican? 
Sure. So when you're talking statewide state election law, uh, the situation breaks down into two categories. You're either a new party or an established party, and the threshold for becoming established is very high. It's 5% of the vote, and to do it statewide, it has to be 5% of the vote in a gubernatorial election year. So even if Jill Stein, uh, for example, the presidential candidate in 2016, had gotten 5% of the vote in Illinois, that still wouldn't have counted. We still would not have been considered a real party by Illinois standards. Um, so you got to get 5%, and until then, you're a new party. And the difference in ballot access in terms of getting your name onto a general election ballot is this. In Illinois, every candidate for office has to submit a petition. That petition has to be signed by a certain number of voters within their district saying, yeah, I want this candidate to be on the ballot. If you're an established party candidate, that number in most races, there are a few races that have a fixed number, but if you're in most races, if you're an established party candidate, that number is equal to one half of 1% of the votes that your party got in the last election. Now, if you're a new party candidate, the number you submit is equal to 5% of the total votes cast in the last election. So that breaks down in different ways in different districts, depending on the partisan vote share. But on average, we looked at the congressional races as a good benchmark, and on average, it's 23 times harder for a third party candidate or an independent to get their name on the ballot as it is for the Democrat or the Republican. And additionally, the time frames are different. The filing period for established parties is roughly a year before Election Day. So Democrats and Republicans filed in uh, uh, October, November. Uh, the, the end of the filing period was December. Can you really quickly just explain why that year means so much? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the difference of knowing that you are actually the candidate of your party with your party's backing a year before Election Day versus four months before Election Day and having that year to be doing campaigning, to be talking to voters. Whereas if you're a third party candidate, you can start before and hope you'll get the nomination, hope you'll become an official candidate, but you're not an official candidate yet, and you're going to have to stop in the middle. You're going to have to stop in the summer before Election Day and take three months to do that petitioning process to gather the number of signatures that's already much higher at a time when everyone else is running ads, they're doing candidate events, you know. So just to kind of uh, to summarize, they, they get about a year, uh, a lot more extra time to build up a base, to get this process done of getting enough signatures to get people to know about them, to raise money. And the Green Party has to do, like you said, several times more signatures in less than half the time with – and then like, I remember last time we spoke um, half a year ago or whenever it was, it was that then when you want to try and raise money for people, they go, oh, are you on the ballot? And you have to be like, well, I mean we, we're going to be on the ballot, we think, and everyone else is already raising money. So you're – a small party with no money that has to fight with half the time while everyone else has already built their infrastructure, you have to start building your infrastructure. That's exactly right. And it, and it also comes down to what are your volunteers doing You know, during that peak uh, summer season? Are you out knocking doors talking about the issues? Are you doing canvassing? Are you doing events? Or are you just standing on train platforms and street corners trying to get these thousands and thousands and thousands of signatures, which ultimately don't really indicate any kind of support. You know, most people, when you shove a clipboard in their face, they either walk away or they sign, and they don't really care much what's on it. You know, we've got, uh, there's that Nazi that got on the ballot, right? And that was because he got on as a Republican in a deeply Democratic district, so he only needed like 600 signatures or something like that. Does, it, does anyone really believe that that means there are 600 devout Nazis in that district? No, it just means that people were willing to sign the clipboard that got pushed in front of them. So it's a meaningless benchmark in the first place. And there are alternatives. There are a lot of states that don't do signatures. Instead, they have a moderate filing fee. Often it'll be like one half of 1% of the salary that the office receives, something like that. A progressive solution that I've seen floated that I would love to see in Illinois is have a filing fee that's something like one half of 1% of the candidate's annual income. And can you imagine if we'd had that in place for Pritzker, Rauner, JB, that could fill a lot of holes in the Illinois state coffers, right? So yeah. there are alternatives. But mm -hmm. again, it's state law. The state legislature would have to make that change. You know, we're seeing nationwide, uh, at least according to the last uh, amount of polling data, that 40% of Americans are identifying themselves as independents. They've lost confidence in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Um, but when it when it finally comes down to actually ha seeing a third party member on the debate stage, um, again they're kind of cast aside. So I think let's looking at the 2016 election cycle. Um, do you think Americans are starting to reevaluate third parties as a political force? And if that's the case, what are the realities that a lot of Americans who want to vote independent what, what are they going to have to deal with, especially if they want to have somebody fight for their issues that's not Democrat or Republican? 
sure. I think like everything in politics, it comes down to who's able to get their message out, who has access to mass communications, right? Most, most people, and I've been knocking a lot of doors for this race, most people when you get on their doorstep and you say, hey, let's talk about the issues, especially when it's a bread and butter issue like water quality, like, hey, is your basement flooding? Hey, does the stream near your house stink? Like, people are real happy to talk to anyone about that, and partisan ideology doesn't come into it that much. But there's only so many face-to-face -face conversations any one candidate can have, so, you know, there are, I think, like you say, a, probably a majority of Americans who are sympathetic to third party or nonpartisan ideology, but when it comes to making the choice in the ballot booth, all the messaging they get and all the media coverage they get is about the binary, it's about two parties, it's about red versus blue. Um, and we're slowly starting to see that change, and I think the rise in new media is helping you know, enormously with that. Um, so especially a lot of younger folks are getting their information from things that aren't the television, things that are willing to reach out and talk to third parties and have those more complicated conversations. So we're seeing the change, but we've got a long way to go before it reaches every American household, and that, that honestly just comes down to money and media. Right, and speaking of media, um, has there been, I know the Green Party has a, a few candidates, not only uh, running for the municipal level, but you guys also have another person who's running for the, at the congressional mm -hmm. level. Um, why has there been a, such a lack of attention from the media towards third parties? I mean, we, we, we mentioned it before, but it almost seems that it's a, on purpose that they are ignoring uh, this growing number that's starting to at least enter the political field. Yeah, no, I, I tell people that there's no surer way to make sure my press releases go into the trash bin than to put Green Party at the head of it. It, it just seems like absolute death on everything we send out. But um, I will say during the primary cycle, part of that is that the Green Party does not have contested primaries in most of our districts right now, you know, that there is one candidate for one seat in most cases. So there's less interest there It's not a when it's not a contested primary. And I'm hopeful that we will see more media coverage once we're on the ballot um, and we're into the general election. Um, now, that said, I think there is a sort of assumption on the part of a lot of media folks that Green Party candidates are unserious candidates, so it's not worth our time and effort to, to cover that. And I don't think that's a fair assessment, but I think the Green Party needs to be willing to do a lot of work to show that, yeah, we are serious candidates, and that's what we've been trying to do with this MWRD campaign, you know, that we have an organized ground game, we have a volunteer team, we've got all the website, Facebook, all of that stuff set up. We've been doing fundraising not just locally but nationally, and we can show that, you know, that we have donors from all across the country who are coming in on this, and that takes away some of the talking points about oh, well, you guys, you're not viable candidates. You know, we're ready to say, no, we've got donors from, you know, 15 different states. We've raised, more, you know, thousands of dollars. As a party that takes no corporate donations, we only accept individual donations. So it's much, much harder what, for us to raise that money because, um, you know, the, the cap on individual donations is much lower than the cap on corporate donations. Um, and obviously it's just a smaller pool to draw from. So. Now, you mentioned earlier in this interview that um, – Cook County is dumping raw sewage every six days into our lake, yeah. uh, but also uh, recently oh, uh, there's not, not into the lake. Let me correct oh, you on oh, that. Sorry. It's into our waterways. Into our waterways. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that correction. But our lake is still at risk due to the fact that we have these unre unregulated industries in Indiana, for example, mm -hmm. that are pouring toxic material into our lake. And so, at least for your office. Uh, what kind of political action can you do to at least hold other states accountable for the toxins that they're putting into a lake that Chicago uses? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're using this lake, and right next door to us, toxic waste is being dumped right into yeah, it. Yeah, it's a huge problem. It's the, you know, there's the industry in Indiana. Uh, across from us, Michigan is one of the only states, I think it's the only state or province on the Great Lakes mm -hmm. that does not have statewide sewage discharge standards. It's municipal standards, so some of the municipalities on the lake do a great job and some of them don't. So there are all kinds of problems all the way around uh, the Great Lakes. And there is a mechanism for handling those disputes. It's called the Great Lakes Compact, and we are a member of it. We're often the bad child in it. Um, we, uh, we've, we are in disputes about Asian carp prevention uh, in the Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal, things like that. Um, the MWRD only has jurisdiction over its own waterways, but you know those commissioners, those representatives, are certainly welcome voices in these sorts of discussions when they happen between all the different water authorities that border on those lakes. And it's not just the states, it's the provinces from Canada as well. It is an international agreement. So I would love to see the MWRD be a strong voice within the Great Lakes Compact and, and also take some of the requests from our neighboring states a little more seriously so that we've got a little more political capital to spend in that international uh, fellowship of uh, provinces and states. Right. Uh, has the MWR actually um, done anything in regards to stepping up and really addressing the pollution that's affecting our lake, be it from Indiana or anywhere else, or at least trying to bring in, like, elected officials that can use their office to institute some kind of change? Sorry, the, uh, what body were you asking about? Uh, uh, sorry, I meant the um, the Water Reclamation oh, Board, the, yes. The MWRD? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I, I don't have the answer to that question. I can't speak for what it, the individual commissioners are currently doing um, to, right. to get more involved with that. I do. The, it, it has most recently come up in the context of um, the request for more action from Illinois on invasive prevention in the Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal, which we are historically foot draggers on. We're resistant to anything that would impede the flow of shipping traffic up and down those locks. Um, All right. So it, it's, it's quite clear that there's a whole system being put in place uh, that's, that really needs to hold – at least the clean, cleanliness of our water, especially like Michigan, like Michigan, to be safe for all the people to use. So w one thing I want to bring up, though, and you mentioned how there's these private companies that are on uh, this 25,000 acre. Right? Ten ton, uh, about 9,500 total. Oh, 95. Okay. That's, uh, you know, and they're using it. Uh, what are the names of these companies? Um, you can actually find them all on the website if you're interested. The MWRD, it's, they have a section for real estate agents, but it includes an interactive map that shows you all of them. There's, there's a number of tenants. I mean, it's quite a lengthy list, uh, the, the parcels of land. There's at least several hundred of them. Um, I don't, don't recall the uh, names off the top of my head, but there are multiple oil storage locations is, is one uh, that I know of. And as I said, an antifreeze manufacturer, there's an asphalt manufacturer. A lot of it just gets used as docking space, you know, for recycling or trash haulers that use barges, things like that. So um, it's quite a varied amount of usage. Um, it does sort of turn into um, something else our campaign has been talking about. It does turn into an environmental justice issue a lot of the time as well because how this land gets parceled out and how it gets used changes dramatically depending on where in Cook County you are. You know, if you're up along the North Shore Canal, that land is being given to municipal governments for sculpture parks, for golf courses, things like that. If you're down on the southeast side, it's being given over to industrial tenants. It's being given over to garbage dumps. It's being given over to chemical storage. And those obviously have an impact on the neighborhoods around them. You know, if your home backs up on a golf course, that's very different from if your home backs up on oil tanks. So um, it's very easy to see how the land use gets parceled out and how that breaks down along racial lines and along in income lines uh, throughout Cook County. Wow, that's definitely crazy. I, I never had no idea that this office had to deal with a lot of those kind of issues. So I think uh, for a lot of our viewers who are at least um, curious about the other con contenders in this race, what are the name of the other four people who are running for the, uh, uh, in the Illinois Green Party as well? Yeah, uh, so the Green, Green Party candidates are going to be Karen Rutan, mm -hmm. uh, who's a southeast side resident. She's in the bush. Tammy Vinson, who lives out in Austin, she's a West Side uh, resident. Uh, Chris Anthony from Pilsen, and then Rachel Wales, who lives out on the, in the Southwest suburbs. She's Oak Park. So those are the four candidates who filed during the normal uh, filing period. Three of them are running for uh, six-year terms, and Rachel Wales is running for the uncompleted two-year term of uh, someone who left a, a candidate or a, a commissioner who left to sit on the Pollution Control Board. And those are all normal elections. They filed as normal candidates. They'll be on the November ballot. It's just that fifth seat, the vacancy of Bradford. Where I am, the Jeff where it's Jeffrey Covage as the write-in candidate for the Illinois Green Party. Well, they listed as that on the ballot, the vacancy of Bradford. Yes, that okay. is the ter so it'll be three different. There are three different ballot lines for MWRD. The first one is going to be the six-year terms, and there will be three of those. Then one there will be the two -year then term. there will be the yeah. two-year term that Rachel Wales is a ballot listed candidate for, and below all of those there will be MWRD commissioner, two-year uncompleted term, vacancy of Bradford, and there will only be the option for a write-in. There won't be any candidates. Now it's quite clear that uh, you know. The if you're voting right now, Democrat Democratic voters have vote for Democratic primary. Republicans vote for you know the respected Republican primary challengers. If they if people want to vote Green, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so people who want to cast their vote for Greens, including in that that write-in election, are going to need to do it on the Green Party ballot. So they go to their uh, polling place or do an early voting location. They can go to early voting from now through Monday or on Tuesday. They can go to their polling place and they say, I want the Green Party ballot. And then it'll either be a touch screen or a paper ballot. Um, you fill in the ovals, check off the boxes, and then on that vacancy of Bradford, you select the write-in option and write in my name. Are people allowed to vote for both Democrats and Green? No, they're not. It's Illinois is a, a semi-open primary is what it's called. So you select one and you get to vote in it. Um, so what, what we've been doing a lot of is knocking on the doors and talking to the homes of folks, uh, specifically along the waterways and on the floodplains uh, was our geographic targeting because we want to talk to people who are affected most. But we've been talking to folks who aren't regular primary voters or who aren't fixed partisan voters, you know, folks who switch parties. So what you're saying ostensibly is that the way the system is set up, if someone wanted to vote for the governor candidate, they would not be able to vote That's for correct. you. That's how it's all set up, yep. So. so our hope is that we're going to turn a lot of people who weren't primary voters at all into habitual primary voters just by convincing them to turn out and pull the green ballot. Now we'll see how that all works out uh, mm -hmm. in the years right. to come. But. And so uh, re the real, real important, though, um, I think I just want to ask this personal question. Significantly, yeah. what would it mean for you to actually win this seat and to actually help implement reform? 
I think it would be incredibly significant for me and, and for everyone who cares about politics in Cook County because the MWRD with its contracting, with the semblance of pay to play, with all the concerns we have about this one party rule, the ability to show that Cook County voters are done with that one party rule, that they're willing to take one party control away from the Cook County Democrat machine mm -hmm. would be so huge, not just for me, but for progressives in the Democratic Party as well. It would be an opportunity to say, look, voters are so tired of how this county is run, that they put a green on your MWRD board, you need to shape up. Um, and I think that would be huge for Cook County and for the city of Chicago. And for me personally, it would be a chance to put so much of this infrastructure and analysis work that I'd been doing you know, in my time as a contractor uh, working on projects in Afghanistan to work here at home. Because let me tell you, I mean, there is Afghanistan is a really, really good example of how bad things get when basic services aren't being met, when people don't have clean soil, when they don't have clean water, when they don't have clean air. Things get very desperate very quickly, and you don't have to go to Afghanistan to see that. You can see that right here in Chicago. And it's happening nationwide. So, so uh, Jeffrey Kovic, thank you so much for joining Hardlands Media. Real quick, where can our viewers find you on social media so they can learn more about your campaign, volunteer for you, or perhaps tell their friends and neighbors about, about your office that you're running for? Absolutely. The easiest portal to find us on is our website, and that is mwrd-ilgp for the MWRD and the Illinois Green Party. So mwrd-ilgp.org. Mm -hmm. uh, they can find us there. And then we also put most of our stuff out through the Illinois Green Party social media. So you can find that as Illinois Green Party on Facebook mm -hmm. and IL Green Party on Twitter. All right. Thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media. Thanks so much for having me here. And to all our viewing audience, thank you so much for listening to us. You're listening to us on Q4 Radio. You can learn more about Q4 Radio at www.qe4radio.org. Um, you can listen to us every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And if you like Hard Lens Media and what we do, check out our website. It's www.hardlensmedia.com. That way we also have a link to our Patreon page. And if you really like what we do, please donate to our Patreon page. It allows us to build uh, more content and produce this show. And to all our viewers and subscribers, thank you again for joining us. Peace, and let's all do what we can to build a better future.